And who's excited to be in church today? Is anybody excited to be here? I know I am. Man, what a day it has turned out to be already. Um, I just want to let you know, uh, first of all, if I haven't had a chance to meet you yet, my name is Elliot, my wife Tiffany and I, who was up here, I think she was on, no, this was the bearded man, this, was the, this is my wife on this side. Uh, my, wife, my wife Tiffany and I have the great privilege of pastoring this group of people called Lifeline Church. Come on, give it up for yourselves because, hey... Sundays are for encouragement, so we just bless you and love you so much. Uh, We have a mission here at the church. Say it with me if you know it. It's to be a lifeline by leading people into becoming lifelong followers of Jesus. That's what we're so passionate about. That's what we're so excited about. That's why we do all the things that we do. Hey, I just want to echo something that... um, uh, Mark, Pastor Mark, Pastor Tiffany, we're sharing with you. Growth track is today, and I wanted to give it um, a little bit of extra push because it's step one today. It's the one that my wife and I will lead together, and um, I just need to explain sometimes what growth track is and what it isn't. Some people think it's a Bible study. It's like some kind of group that you can be in and, and whatever, and we're going to teach you because you're new, whatever. And that's not really what it is. Growth track, what growth track is is an on-ramp into everything that goes on in the church, really everything that happens in the whole church. As, as, as our, like the life groups, you get involved in the life groups through Growth Track. You serve on the Dream Team through Growth Track. You can, what else can you do? You can, um, you could get engaged apparently because we had an engagement this morning, man. It happened uh, on the Dream Team. Oh yeah, Victor, who was right here, got engaged this morning in our morning rally. Come on, can we give it up for them? Hallelujah. So you can hear it from me first. Join our dream team and you never know what might happen. <laughs> all the single ladies, all the single ladies, all the single ladies. Uh-oh, uh-oh. I'm going to get myself in trouble right, right up in here, man. It's an on-ramp into you never know. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. How far do I want to take this joke? Not any farther. Not any farther. That's, that's about it. I would love to have the opportunity to uh, walk you through everything that we believe as a church in Growth Track. So stick around after church today. Leave your kiddos in the classrooms there. They're going to have a great time, and we'll walk you through uh, everything that we believe in and everything that we are passionate about. That's in Growth Track Step 1 today. Go ahead and take out your message notes. If you grabbed a bulletin on the way in, they were probably like whacking you in the face with one as you were walking in. Take bulletin. <laughs> No, no, no. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. But there's notes inside there that you can take notes along with the message. And uh, there's also the YouVersion Bible app um, that you can um, follow along with. Uh, we might have a slide for it. I, I used to have a slide. Oh, there it is. You can scan that code and download the YouVersion Bible app. And it's, a, um, it's probably the most famous Bible app there is. And we've got in there, we've got Lifeline Church in there, so that you can take notes in there and you can see all the message notes inside the app. That's the way I do it. When Tiffany's preaching, I, I just sit on the front and I open the Bible app and it's easy to go. Because we want you guys to remember as much as possible some of these principles that we're bringing to you because we want it to impact your real life. So part of that is just taking some notes, jotting some things down, ready to listen and ready to receive everything that God has for you. Amen. Amen. All right, that's great. So we're in part five of this series called Who Am I? Dealing with one of the most, I don't know, fundamental questions that we face as believers, as human beings, really, like if you're a believer or not. As a human being, we face this issue. Who am I? What, what am I designed for? Who, who was I created to be? And what about when the hard times come? How do I find my identity in the midst of all that? Some of you might know, some of you might not, that Jesus was um, faced with a lot of temptation early on in his ministry. He he got baptized, filled with the Holy Spirit, and then he was out in the the wilderness, right? Some of you might remember this story. And every time the devil was attacking him, he was attacking his identity. If you are the son of God, if you, and if he's attacking Jesus with identity, how much do you want to, want to bet that he's probably going to attack us in our identity, and, and how we see ourselves and how, if we see ourselves as sons and daughters of the Most High God or see ourselves as sneaking in the back door. If we see ourselves that way, like barely deserve to be here, I don't know, like spiritual people over there and then I'm over here. If we see ourselves that way, we're going to miss out on some good things that God wants to do in your life. So that's why we're doing this series called Who Am I? Very important. Now, we've also been doing these life groups together. Come on, raise your hand at me and, and applaud some. If you've been in a life group recently, come on, show me if you're in a life group right now. Look, many people, many people are. Um, I think we had more people signed up for life groups than we had showing up on Sundays. I don't know what happened there. Um, 
Honestly, it's like, you know, his preaching's okay, but I think I'll go to a life group. I'm not crushed. No, I'm not. I'm, I feel good. I feel good about it. Say amen to me. No, I'm uh, no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. We're, we've been doing these groups, and they're totally fun. I got, I got a group on Wednesday night that is really, really fun. I got like a couple, a couple excited people that are in there, but uh, really fun. And the thing about these groups is they're following the message series called Who Am I? So we've been reading this book, and we've been following along, but it's about to switch gears in a couple weeks. And all of these groups are going to launch into their own stuff. Like the women's group, we're going to talk about, you know, a, a, book, a different book. And then the men's groups are going to talk about different stuff. And then it's just going to branch out. So what I'm trying to tell you is in a couple weeks or even now, it's still a good time to sign up for a life group if you haven't already. If you're looking for community, if you're looking for really everything the church is supposed to be, and everything the church, I mean the capital C, like the church, like this whole establishment and everything that God designed the church to be happens in groups, happens in community. This is fun. We have a good time. But really, the, the life change happens in the context of those relationships. I can't encourage you enough to get involved in those groups. So let's jump in. This week, in this Who Am I uh, study, we're going to talk about probably one of the most famous, longest sermons that Jesus ever preached, and it had a topic that might surprise you. Happiness. Happiness. I bet you're like, no, we're not supposed to talk about being happy in church. That is not allowed, pastor. Let me coach you up because I was raised in church and I know that I'm supposed to be holy, not happy. And the less happy I am, the more holy I must be. Amen. Let me hit you with this title today. Who am I when I don't feel happy? When I don't feel happy, which is so, so common and a very under- under talked about? That's not a phrase. It doesn't get talked about that much in churches. And so I really wanted to bring this up and I'm glad it's a, con a, a topic that we're going to bring up here. I, I just personally, I was not raised in church. I had to come in as an adult. And when I came in and I, and I started to see like the faces of the people around me, I'm like, am I allowed to be happy in here? Because I'm a pretty happy guy. I'm an I'm a upbeat, positive guy. And I'm like, Wait, 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 wait. Am I supposed to switch gears a little bit, be a little bit more downer? Is that how I'm going to fit in here? It's pretty crazy. And you might be tempted to ask as well, am I allowed to be happy? Is that a valid desire to even have, to be happy? Or am I allowed to care about this? Only allowed to be holy? Like, it's like the more miserable you are, the more spiritual you must be. I want you to uh, try something with me. Just picture Picture a person, the most spiritual person you could think of, the most holy, sacred, spiritual person you could think of, past, present, or future, whatever, and, and just picture them right now. Go ahead, in your mind, in your mind, just like think about them. Are they, are they going like this? Or do they look like this? Probably right here, right? It's like, what, why is it that we automatically associate holiness and spirituality with like some monk in Tibet that is like, I haven't eaten in 45 days, but I'm so spiritual. Man, am I allowed? To, like, is that, is that the goal? Is that what we're all supposed to be like? When I first came here uh, to the church, you know, I, I, must, I thought I was looking around. I thought some people had the spiritual gift of being grumpy and complaining. It's like a spiritual gift. I'm taking a spiritual gifts test and I'm like, well, I'm not grumpy and I'm not complaining. So it's like, I thought it was a spiritual gift that some people have. They're singing, they're singing that little song. Maybe you've heard of it, but you have to sing it with the right face. You have to, I got the joy, 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 joy down in my heart. <sighs> down in my heart. <sighs> Down in my heart. It's too low. The joy is too low. It needs to rise up from where your heart is, and it needs to let your face know how happy you are. You got the joy down in your heart. You need it on your face. That's where you need it. You need to let the world know. You got the joy down deep, deep down in your heart. Way, way down. It's too deep. It's too deep. The, the, the joy is too deep down there. The most famous sermon and, the, and the, one of the longest sermons that is recorded of Jesus, he preached on nine statements of what it means to be blessed. It's called the Beatitudes. When I first started reading the Bible, I thought it was the Beatitudes. I don't know. No one was coaching me up about this stuff. I didn't know. I was just a new believer. I didn't know nothing. I thought it was the book of Job. And I was like, well, I need a job. I'm going to read this book right here. Get me a job. Nobody told me. Nobody told me. I wasn't told. I had to figure it out on my own. 
But the Beatitudes, it's uh, nine statements about how to be blessed, and there's lots of these statements, and you probably read it like this, blessed are those, blessed are those who, who hunger and thirst, blessed are those who are persecuted, blessed are those who are humble. Well, let me tell you, we're going to get into some study right now. There, that's a Greek word. Um, I have to read it. Mak- makarios, makarios. I, I'm not, I don't speak Greek, all right? So you just have to bear with me. Makarios, that's, how, that's like the pronunciation of it. And what it means, that word, it means blessed, fortunate, or happy. Some translations even say, happy are those. Happy are those who are poor in spirit and know their need for God. Happy are those who are persecuted. The kingdom of God is there. Happy are those. Happy, happy, happy. That's like what the word means. It's like, have you ever met somebody? Or maybe you yourself have said, you know, I'm having a terrible day, but I'm blessed. You know, I feel like garbage, but I'm blessed. And honestly, if you, if you look at the word that Jesus was using, that's not, that's not what it means. It, the, the, in the definition is happy, fortunate, blessed. There's, it's supposed to be that kind of feeling. It's, it, you could have called this whole message of, of Jesus, Nine Keys to Happiness by Jesus Christ. All right, he probably would have got pelted in the bookstores for that. I understand. But honestly, if you look at the Greek language and that word, it's nine statements to, to be happy in order to, but real happiness. And we're going to get into that right now. Matthew 5, 5, out of the Good News translation, the Good News Bible says this, happy are those who are humble for they will receive what God has promised. That means the more humility you have, the more happiness you will receive. It's a more grounded, real happiness that lasts. It's like a foundation. If you're humble, you, you have this you have this ability to just be like, I'm right here and I'm all right. But as Americans, you know this. You're most of us raised in America and, and you know that it's in our language, you know, the pursuit of happiness. We call it an inalienable right to, to pursue happiness. But there's this poll called the Harris Poll that reports that only 30% of people who are asked if you're happy, 70% say, no, nah, I'm not. If it's our rights and if it's something that Jesus talks about, how come so few people would say, yeah, I'm, I'm happy. And if they're asked honestly, you say, no, you know what? I don't feel good. Yeah, I'm just, I'm just believing for the best, but I feel terrible. Why? Why is that? That is worth talking about. That is worth talking about in church. We assign happiness, and here's, the, here's a big problem. We assign happiness to an emotion. And emotions change throughout the day. At least mine do, based on how much coffee I had based on how late I was up last night, which was kind of late, so you're going to get a version of me that you don't always get, because I've got that sleepy energy, you know the kind? That weird sleepy energy that no coffee can, can fix. Throughout the day, my, if I'm sleepy, my, I'm not happy. If I'm too busy, if I stubbed my toe, I'm not happy. It's like no matter what, what comes my way, my emotion changes throughout the day. Our idea of happiness is circumstantial. That's an issue. That's the real issue, in fact. It's, it's a circumstantial kind of happiness. I'm happy if, I'm happy if this good thing happens. I'm happy if no one talks to me today. <laughs> I'm happy if my kids leave me alone. Come on, parents, you know what I'm talking about. I'm not the only one. <laughs> Don't look at me like that. In order to feel happy, you need things like likes on Instagram. You need an attaboy at work. You need good grades on your tests. You need all of these things in order to feel happy. And then just as quick as it came, bam. Good feelings gone. <laughs> you ever watch Nemo? Good feelings gone. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm, you know, boy and girl dad. I have to, I have to go to Disney for a lot of my phrases here. If we're honest, if we're just being honest with each other, and this is a place of truth, the church is a place of truth. We want to feel happy. We do. We we want to we want to be happy. So why are we not allowed to talk about this? Why is it so hard to come by? Why does it seem like it's so elusive? But we want, and what you and I both want is real happiness. Happiness that transcends circumstances, that doesn't just follow whether I get a good grade or a bad grade, whether I have a good day or a bad day. We want happiness that lasts through it all, don't we? That's what we'll talk about today. And think about it this way, parents, uh, check this out. If you're a parent, the only thing that you want more than happiness for yourself is happiness for your children. Isn't that right? I've heard it said, and I think it's very true, you can only be as happy as your least happy child. I'm going to just leave that right there, let that marinate, and let you, uh, let you confirm. Your least happy child 
that's as happy as you can be. Like, then you don't get happier than your least happy child because they will prevent it. They will stop it. They will block it. No, you are not allowed to be happier than me. I'm going to scream. Oh my, okay, okay. But we love them. We love them so much. They're so good. You can only be as happy as your least happy kid, but there is no pain like kid pain. Now that's real. That's real. Whether your kids are small or whether they're grown, when your kids are, are hurting in pain, if they get a physical injury, I remember when Evan slammed his head into Emma's uh, or his, his face and, and his tooth was like out. And I make fun of him all the time, but I did not make fun of him right then. I was like, oh my God, are you okay? Oh my gosh. And Tiffany reached in and popped his tooth right back into place. She is such a gangster. She's so gangster. I, I got all clammy, you know? You know that feeling when like you, get a, you see a little tiny bit of blood and you're like, oh, I'm gonna faint. That was me. And Tiffany was like, reached her. She got wrist deep up in Evan's mouth and popped it back here. Drink some milk. It'll put your tooth back in there. Who is she like Rambo woman? I don't know. Crazy. Crazy. Now, if we want our kids to be happy, to be well-adjusted, to be content, and we're earthly parents, how much more does our heavenly father want us to be content, healthy, and well-adjusted and happy? Our heavenly father wants that for us. Jesus said this, Matthew 5, 3, happy are those who know they are spiritually poor. Hold up, what? Okay, hold on, let's slow that down because I, th I think I'm not reading it right. Let's read it again and see if it's right. Happy are those who know they are spiritually poor for the kingdom of heaven is there. If you need help understanding this, you are with me. I need help understanding this. I had to look into this early on too. I'm like, that doesn't make any sense. I don't want to be spiritually poor. I want to be spiritually, yeah, I want to feel good. I want to go for it. But there's a truth being taught here and we're gonna get help from a character in the Bible. He's not a character, he was a real life human being man. His name's Solomon. He was the son of King David, known as the wisest, richest, probably the most powerful uh, person in the Bible that we can even talk about. And he wrote a book called Ecclesiastes. It means like sayings of the teacher. Uh, it's just a really like, it's wisdom, really. He wrote Proverbs and Ecclesiastes. It's a series of reflections is really what it is from Solomon. And you could also call it, I like to give weird names to stuff. You could call it the diary of a billionaire. We're, you know how we're going to get uh, some help being happy? We're going to read the diary of a billionaire, but it's not going to give you the advice that you might expect, okay? He was greater in both wisdom and riches than any other person in history that we know of. Uh, he was uh, universally respected and enjoyed the finest luxuries that the world had to offer. People came from all over the known world to get his counsel and his wisdom. He wasn't only rich. He didn't only have like all the stuff, but people looked up to him and his wisdom too. He had it all, all the finest food, all the money in the world, like art hanging up in his hallways, romance. Let me tell you about Solomon's romance level. 700 concubines and 300 wives. Let me tell you why he, did, he wasn't happy all the time. Like he thought that was gonna bring him happiness. I don't even know how to like, what direction to take that in, but boy had ladies around him. He had ladies around him. I have a hard time being happy, you know, just wh whatever. It's okay. I'm just going to say, I'm good with one. That's what I'm trying to say. I can barely handle one wife. This guy had 300 plus 700 others. Really weird, really weird stuff. But like, that's not what the message is about today. <laughs> Move on, Elliot. Move on. Okay. I know what you might be thinking. I know what you might be thinking. Why am I going to take happiness advice from a billionaire with a thousand women all around him, how am I supposed to relate with a guy who has everything that people in general are looking for and want? He has all that stuff, so why am I gonna take happiness advice from him? He has everything I'm trying to get. Here's what the Bible Times Tony Stark would tell us, because that's basically how I picture him. He's like, I don't know, except he, whatever. It's been a late night. All right, here's what the Bible Times Tony Stark, this is what he's gonna tell us. This is what he writes in Ecclesiastes 1, verse two. He has, remember, keep in mind, he has everything and he says this, meaningless. Meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher. Utterly meaningless. Everything is meaningless. He says it's 36 times in his book. Meaningless, meaningless, meaningless. Since we're doing word studies today, let's do another one. This is a, a Hebrew word, habel. Habel. So the New Testament was written in Greek, and the Old Testament, 
was written in Hebrew, except for the book of Daniel, which was written in Aramaic. So this is a Hebrew word. It means habel. It's pronounced habel, and it's, it, what it means is a vapor, meaningless. It's a vapor, like a wisp of smoke. You try to grab it. It's like there. You can see it. You grab it, and it goes, pa, gone, meaningless. It also it has been described like this word. has It's very rich definition. It's like dropping a bucket down in a well, and you're doing all the work. You drop the bucket down in there, and you pull it all up. You're like, so thirsty, and you pull it up, empty bucket. That's what the word means, habel, empty bucket, vapor, meaningless. It's, it's like you try, you can see it, you could try to grab it, but it just disappears. This is the man who had everything, and he said, meaningless, meaningless. All of this stuff that I have, it's all meaningless. That's what every worldly thing will get you. Vapor, meaningless. Man, and... and and I know I'm, I'm, I'm talking to Americans today and we are inundated and taught, man, you got to get that next promotion. You got to get your retirement, man. You got to get the fullness and you got to get the boat and you got to get a new car. You got to have two cars, one for your wife. Man, if you're a real man, you get one for your wife and then you got to have the everything. <laughs> Meaningless. Meaningless. Now, I'm not preaching against, you know, ha- having a good job and having a retirement. I'm not. But Solomon is trying to teach us If that's how you're chasing your happiness, you're going to come to the end of your life and be really sad. Or you might not have to wait till the end. You might get sad about halfway through and realize you've been putting points up on the wrong scoreboard this whole time. It's it's really, it's really tough. It's really tough. So let me guess what you might be thinking. (laughs) Give me that billion dollars. I'll see if I could be happy with it. (laughs) That's what I thought. It's like this guy, he's got everything in the whole world. He couldn't figure out how to be happy. I think I might be able to figure it out. I might be able to figure out how to be happy. But let's put it in perspective. He's the wisest man. God calls him. He asks for wisdom. When God was honoring him and blessing him as a young king, he said, you could ask for anything. And he asked for wisdom. And he said, oh, that's the best thing. God said, that's the best thing you could ask for. So on top of all that wisdom, I'm going to give you riches and I'm going to give you glory and you're going to be looked up to. And he had everything. And he wrote, meaningless. That's crazy to me. It's so counter the world we live in. It's opposite to everything that we, that we, we work towards. It's like our whole game plan is to get to a certain level, to get to a certain status. And he says, meaningless, meaningless. The pursuit of happiness, the way we understand it, is a cautionary tale. It really is. We need to take caution in this. He had everything, the most money, the most power, the most authority, the most prestige, the most honor, and nobody could take it away. So what did he say? What was his answer? Let's jump to that part. Ecclesiastes 3.10 says this. I have seen the burden that God has laid on the human race. He has made everything beautiful in its time. He has also set eternity in the human heart. Pause right here for a second. He said eternity in the human heart. And this is why, this is exactly why I believe all the worldly things in the world will never satisfy. Because in our hearts, we understand it's the eternal things that matter. And so that's why every time we get a new promotion, we forget about it as soon as we get it. We've been been focused on it, focused on it, focused on it. Then we have it and we're like, huh, man, it's the next thing I need. And we want to move into the next neighborhood and we're like focused on that, better neighborhood. I want to get my own place. And as soon as you get there, It doesn't take very long before you start thinking about the next thing and our contentment leaves us. Am I the only one? (laughs) It's true. That's what happens because God has set eternity in our hearts and we keep on searching for the wrong thing. And as soon as we think we get it, as soon as we think we get our hand on it, it it disappears. And Solomon's trying to teach us. It's meaningless. It's meaningless because eternity is in our heart and our hearts, even whether you're following Christ or not, this is why people who are not following Christ and aren't taught about these things, they keep on having that, that hole we talk about. There's a hole in my heart and I just can't fill it with anything else. And every time, I, every time you could be the richest person in the room and you still feel empty on the inside, it's because eternity's in there. And only the eternal things will ever truly satisfy. It goes on to say this, yet no one can fathom what God has done from beginning to end. Listen, Solomon came to the finish line of human greatness. He was the greatest human, like he had everything. And he looked at it and said, this ain't it. (laughs) I've got everything I could possibly want and this ain't it. So what's the conclusion? Verse 12, I know that there is nothing better for people than to be happy. There's that word again, happy. 
Weird. We're going to talk about to be happy and to do good while they live. That each of them may eat and drink and find satisfaction, happiness and satisfaction in all their toil. As you're working, you can, you can be happy. You can be satisfied in your normal everyday life. You can find happiness in that. Said the richest man in the whole world, you never met anybody as rich as this guy who had all the things that he had. And he's saying, look, I got all this stuff and it's like a vapor. It's like a smoke. I have learned. I've come to the end of human greatness and said, this ain't it. This does not, this does not scratch the itch that I have that brings me satisfaction. I'm still not happy. Still not happy. You've all heard the stories and, and read the magazine articles about, about multimillionaires who are depressed, getting counseling. Isn't it the stars and the, the famous people? It's like, it's because we chase that so much. And, it, and you don't have to be a movie star to experience this fallacy. This is, for, this is for all of us. We can all fall into this trap. We can all fall into this trap. It's a version of happiness, a twisted version of happiness that gets us mixed up. So let's get to the solution side, as we like to say. Let's, let's not focus on the problem. Let's focus on the solution. Where do we need to go? Write this in your notes. If you're taking notes, true happiness is more than an elusive feeling. It's, we're not chasing that. We're not chasing a feeling I'm not hooked on a feeling, you know? I almost sang it, it was so close. <sighs> Kids, don't, don't worry about it. Just, we're, you just if you laughed, you, you aged yourself. It's okay, it's, you aged yourself, it's all right. We have two contrasting examples in the Bible of how to pursue happiness, Solomon and Jesus. Now, they both ended up coming to the same conclusion, but they took different paths to get there. Let me explain. Solomon did this. This is in your notes as well. Solomon is a king. He was a king who experienced the fullness of every pleasure, yet lived empty. There is no pleasure in the world that could ever satisfy him. He was chasing power and pleasure and riches, and uh, he was chasing people, you know, women to make him feel happy, and the, right, the exact right career, come on, let's get back to real life. Like when we, when we chase these things, we can chase fullness of the human experience, yet live empty. That was Solomon's experience, and it will never make you happy. But Jesus is a king who emptied himself and lived full. He emptied himself and lived full. It's so backwards, isn't it? It's so odd to talk about. It's so mixed up. It doesn't make any sense. And we're talking about happiness, which seems like such a human feeling. And like, that's why we want to stay away from it because it has this, this connotation to it. But Jesus, I would argue, was a happy guy. He was the one saying, happy are those. You could be happy when you're persecuted. You're most happy when you're humble. You're most happy when you know how spiritually poor you are and you know when you're hungry for God, when you're hungry for more of the word and to seek his presence, when you know how poor you are, how far you have to go, that's when you're happy. Oh, it's good. I need to know that because I don't want to be stuck in depression. Do you? No. I don't want to experience sadness and depression for my whole life. Hey, it's not a bad thing if you've been there. But I want to help get you out of there if that's where you find yourself today. And this is the answer. Jesus is the answer. He will show us how to empty ourselves so that we can be full. This is so important. He emptied himself for us. And in that, he was showing us the way to live full. Until you fully give yourself to Jesus, there will always be an emptiness that you feel, an emptiness that you experience. And yet, in a bizarre twist, that's when you find fulfillment and joy is when you empty yourself. When we empty ourselves and give ourselves fully to him, that's when we experience it. So how can we experience this kind of Jesus happiness? That's like really hard to say, Jesus happiness. How to have Jesus happiness. I, it's like talking is hard. I talk for a living, you know, it's tough. Here, let's look at some bi biblical principles that can, that can help, help you on your, on your path to, to get some happiness because that's what I want you to have. Number one is this. Write this in your notes. Please remember this. It's so important. Acknowledge the effects that events have on your happiness level. I want you to just acknowledge it. Acknowledge that we get moved when stuff happens to us. Like my golf game, for example. <laughs> when bad things happen, it's like every time I pull out a golf club, that's, it's, I'm not as happy. 
I am happy. I'm like looking forward to it, want to do well. And then as soon as I, I can't say I hit the ball fat. I have to say big and beautiful. I hit the ball big and beautiful, like this far behind the ball. Only golfers would get that joke. It's, that's all right. There's only a few golfers in here. That's fine. We have tendencies, I'm saying, we have tendencies to let our performance in life impact our emotions. Like when I don't do a good job, when I tell a bad joke, when I, when I uh, play bad golf, when when my wife isn't happy with me or when I don't do something right, that impacts my happiness level. I need to acknowledge that. I need to acknowledge that I am susceptible to that. Uh, And even things outside of our control, uh, allow me to be vulnerable with you. Um, This is a place of truth, like I say, so I'll just tell you the truth. Especially early on in ministry and being a pastor, you know, things, things impacted my mood. Things like attendance level, Things like the giving that week, things like whether people said amen or whether they look like they were about to fall asleep listening to me, is things I can't really control or things just outside, like the, the outside events. And for you, you got to fill in the blanks here for yourself. You have to recognize the things that you know have a tendency to impact your happiness level. And that's why I decided like years ago, you know what, I'm going to instead, I'm going to step out and I'm going to choose to, to recognize those things that have a tendency, because that's my, that's my job, right? That's my career. So for you, it might just be something totally different. When circumstances are good, listen to this, we're happy because we think we're better than we are. Like, let's say the alternative is true. Everybody shows up, everybody's like laughing, everybody's having a good time. Then I think, oh yeah, I got this, yeah. Because I'm letting my happiness follow what's going on around me instead of finding it on the inside. And Solomon said, that's a trap. You're going to get trapped in that. And that's not what true happiness is. When circumstances are good, we're happy because we think we're better than we are. And when circumstances are bad, here's the problem. We're unhappy because we see ourselves as less than or worthless. We have to base our confidence and our contentment on what is concrete, not what is fickle. That's what we have to do. You must acknowledge that circumstances are trying to own your feelings. Sometimes just reminding yourself that your happiness is, based, is not based on circumstances makes all the difference. It starts with just acknowledging it. And then we're going to move on to some real, real action steps, starting with number two. Write this in. It says, be willing to confront your unhappiness. So if you're feeling that way, like, like I explained in the beginning of this message, that's not a spiritual gift. <laughs> that is not some kind of like, well, I'm holy, so I just feel terrible, but I'm still blessed. No, 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 no. No, 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 no. You can confront that. You can confront those feelings of depression, of sadness, of unhappiness. You confront those things. We have to attack unhappiness and discontentment because that's what it really is, is discontentment. Like a messy house. Let me tell you about a pet peeve of mine. I like a clean house and my wife is probably rolling her eyes to the back of her skull right now because she knows as much as I like a clean house, she knows as soon as I walk in the door, I take my backpack off, I kick my shoes off. Come on, does anybody put their socks just like in the living room? Am I, no, just me? Okay, cool. Cool, 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 cool. It's just me, right on. We have to attack it like a, like a, because let me tell you, the unhappiness and a messy house share a lot of similarities. They don't clean themselves, and if you leave it alone, it only gets worse. Only gets, someone's someone's like, someone's like, my house is messy. My house is messy right now. So I'm a clean freak. I am. I'm a clean freak when I want to be. When when I want to be. Like when it's not my turn to clean up. That's when I want to be a clean. That's when I say amen to a clean house is when it's not my job to do it. Um, I like light and bright and clean and like when decorating the house, like I, I get involved in decorating my house, y'all. I know you can see denim, denim, denim and you go like, this guy likes coordination. I can tell. I can just tell like looking at him. He probably likes that kind of stuff. So yes, it's true. And so when I'm like, let me just tell you a little bit about, about me at home. Like I'm on my phone. I'm talking to one of you, you know, because I'm a pastor for a living and you guys got a lot of problems. So you call me and you're like, hey, fix all my problems. That's what I'm talking to you. I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me tell you what you could do this. You could do that. And like, we're like, we're getting those demons out of there and we're talking. But as soon as Evan, my youngest, goes running through a mud puddle and starts heading to the door, I will talk into my phone and say, you had these demons 20 years. You can have them five more minutes. Hang up on you. (laughs) Look at Evan and go, you stop right there. You are not getting into my house. 
Because we remodeled that thing like three years ago, and you ain't messing it up. Because I'll tell you this about some muddy shoes and some kids running around in my house. It's not just going to land on the floor. It's going to get on my pillow somehow. It's going to get on the bedspread. It's going to get on the countertop. It's going to be mud in the sink. Bro, how would you get your feet in the sink? What happened? I have a lot, have a lot of issues. <laughs> Pray for me. Pray for me. But let me just say, unhappiness is like that. We just let a little unhappiness, and it gets all over the place. You don't have any peace. You let that happiness come, un, unhappiness come into your life, and you're trying to concentrate at work. You can't because you're unhappy. And then you're trying to go to sleep at night. You can't because of the depression. And then everywhere you go, because it's just like muddy feet, that unhappiness, that depression will spread if it goes undealt with. You've got to face it. You've got to attack it. You have to be willing to confront your unhappiness. You just have to be willing to do it. Unhappiness steals our joy and fulfillment from every area of your life. That's why you must confront it, attack it. Those feelings of entitlement, discontentment, you have to handle those. I'm giving you the advice right here, right now. These are biblical principles. You have to handle that stuff. Like face it and say, you know what? I'm acknowledging that this stuff impacts me. And number two, I'm going, to I'm going to attack it. I'm going to confront it. And then what do we need to do? Number three, these are some real action steps I want you to take. Focus on the practical choices that produce real happiness. You've acknowledged it. You're going to confront your unhappiness. And now we're going to make some real choices and, and do some things to, that are going to bring real, that's going to bring real happiness into your life. There are choices you can make that impact your happiness level. And rest assured, the choice is yours. The first little piece of advice I want to give you is this, and you can write this in, it's in your notes. Stop complaining and blaming your unhappiness on someone else. <laughs> Let's just start it off with the most important one, shall we? Let's just go, I'll go downhill from here. You've got to stop doing that because that's something you can't fix. You can't fix others. And let me just tell you the truth. That's not where your unhappiness is coming from. If you think someone has control over your emotions, you don't. They don't. You, that, it's you. You own that. It is your choice. That's why you and me can go into the same workplace can have the same work environment, can be just as busy as one another, and one person can be unhappy and the other can be happy. Why? Because one is choosing to blame their circumstances, to blame the people and say, you know what? Well, I can't be happy because that idiot, you would never say that. A bunch of good church people in here, you would never do that, right? Never. Just go ahead and write it down. Fold this piece of paper up, keep it in your back pocket, open it later when no one's around and go, I need this. No one has to raise their hand because I do it too. I do it too. These are things we need to remember. We can't blame our, our, we can't blame our unhappiness on other people. We just can't do it. Don't blame it on your in-laws, not your boss, not your spouse. They are not in charge of your happiness level. Some of you grew up in an environment where that, where that was normal. And I want to just take a minute and acknowledge that that some of us grew up seeing this, like this is what it was in our homes or in wherever, you know, for you. And you saw it, you learned it, you internalized it, you took it on. And, and the bickering and the complaining and the backbiting and the arguing is something that you're gonna have to overcome. But I want you to face it. I want you to realize that that is not, that is not what Jesus wants for us. And that's not even what we want for us. You see that behavior in others and you go, ew, I don't want to be that, but somehow we find ourselves doing the same thing. I do. I just, I'll, just, I'll just take it on. You guys don't have to admit. I, I will. I do it too, and I have to remind myself not to do it. I have to take inventory. We need to take inventory. Are you becoming what you don't want? Change it. Don't let someone else own your happiness level. Don't let someone else own how depressed or happy that you are. Second thing is this. Make gratitude a part of your daily routine. Make gratitude a part of your daily routine. I, I don't like to wish for things, like even with our leaders here at the church. We don't like to wish for things, like when I'm training somebody or helping somebody or trying to coach someone, I like to say we're training for things. I'm not hoping for things, we're training for things. So this is training ourselves. I wanna teach you how to train yourself for gratitude, how to train yourself to look at the bright side, how to train yourself to not be a pessimist, but to, but to find hope in every situation. 
and to be able to look forward. Any perfectionists in the room today? Am I the only one? Any perfectionists in here? The kind of perfectionist that will let one wrong thing demolish your good day. No, nobody here. Nobody would do that. It's like, I'm, I got to be honest with you again. Like, I could, it could be the best church service ever. All right? I mean, this is what I do, so this is like where my examples come from. You're just going to have to deal with it. When I'm here and everything's going good and people get saved at the end of the message and worship is on point and then like what the, the TV flickers like one time. I'm like, ugh, stupid TV. Ugh, why isn't it working? Why can't we get some good equipment around here? Ugh, the, the thing wasn't working or whatever, just whatever wrong thing, and I fixate. Do you? Does it happen to you? Where you focus on the one wrong thing instead of the dozens of good things you could choose to celebrate. This is a habit that we train ourselves in. This we train ourselves in. We get all wound up. We get all wound up on, on circumstances that we can't control. And if, if anything is getting you down, I want you to stop. I want you to get out of the environment you're in. Like go for a walk or do something. And I want you to start reciting some of the good things happening in your life. That might sound really like strange and very specific, but that's what I do. I do that. I go on a, I go on a prayer walk every single morning when it's not raining. <laughs> when it's not, you, most mornings, most mornings I go on a prayer walk and the very first thing I do, this is just me, and it sets the tone for my day and it really sets the tone for my life. And I just start reciting good things. Things like, thank you God, I slept in a, bed last night mm -hmm. Amen. because I know what it feels like to not yep. have a roof over my head and to be down and out and I never want to forget I never want to forget so I start my day thank you I slept in a bed last night and then I thank you for my wife thank you for my kids you know, thank you for this wonderful church family that I have people building me up I want you to take that habit on I want you to try it I want you to use it this is where happiness comes from, from having an attitude, oh gosh, of gratitude. <sighs> I didn't even want to do that. I'm so sorry. But there was no other way. I had to finish it. This will change your life. This one activity could possibly change your life. You could take that one nugget and be like, I got what I needed today. Get out of the environment you're in if you're feeling down, if you're feeling low, and start reciting the good things that you have in your life. Um, second thing is this, uh, choose to generously serve and bless others without expectation of return. You all know my, my favorite verse, right? I've, I've told it to you a couple of times, like a life verse of mine. Let me explain it to you. It's Proverbs eleven twenty five. The generous will prosper. Those who refresh others will themselves be refreshed. I love that verse more than life itself because I need the refreshment. And it's like telling me, here's how you get it. It's so easy. All you got to do is refresh others. It's so simple. It's so simple. And it's, we complicate it more than it needs to be complicated. Go out and bless and generously serve others without an expectation of return. I get that scripture and I just want to tattoo it on my neck. I like, don't have any tattoos, but I'll get one right here. Proverbs eleven twenty five. Oh, man. Sorry, guys. It's, it's just one of those days. I'm feeling so good. It's a life verse for me personally because it sets the tone of what it means to be a lifeline and live on mission for Jesus. And it's twofold. I don't often talk about like the context of the, the, the passage is actually written in. It's a financial scripture. I'm sorry to have to say that. You know, we're so, we're so tiptoey around finances sometimes. But let me, just, let me just explain. It is a financial scripture. First and foremost, we, we love to talk about, about serving others and blessing others. Just give them your time. It's all good. But I just need to let you know that Tiffany and I, like we, we take the first half of that, the generous will prosper. The, and the, it, the context of it is talking about finances, but we, it's, a bigger, it's a bigger concept than just that. But I want you to know, like first and foremost, I don't often do this, but Tiffany and I, we were tithing and giving before we got married. And then we came together and we're like, let's kick it up because we just, we want this. We want to refresh others. We want to invest in the kingdom of God because we want to be blessed ourselves. And so I don't always bring that up in this context of this, but I needed to because it's not just giving a high five to someone. It's actually, you know, giving an investment that hurts sometimes. Refreshing others isn't always easy, but it's how we get refreshment. There's also another aspect of it is serving others. And again, growth track, everybody. 
Growth track is today. It is the way to serve. And, uh, you know, it's also a way to find single ladies. So come on, just go. <laughs> you never know. Someone might put a ring on it. <sighs> I'm not making any promises, but we kind of got a track record. That's the second proposal in like 18 months so on the team here. So, you know, hey, the chances are looking good. <sighs> Refresh others. Oh, my God. It's not, that, it's not that we're generous with our finances or serving. Tiffany and I, and like we do it personally. We're not one or the other. We're generous and open-handed with all of it because we need it so badly. We need the refreshment. We want to be refreshed. And what do I have that's not God's? What, what do I have that's not his anyway? So I give it freely away. This last part right here is surround yourself with people who share the same values. And this is a part that people miss. Because we talk a lot about, we talk a lot about, um, you know, having these principles and whatever. And, and as Americans or just as in our society, it's like, I'm going to do it myself, right? I'm just going to do it myself. I'm going to take care of myself. I'm going to take care of me. It's just me, myself, and I. And I'm going to go home and I'm going to think about this. And I'm going to take care of it myself. But that's not the way God intended for us to live our lives. That's not the way God intended us to live our lives at all. He wants us to live in, a, in context of, of people around us. Like the flip side of giving and generosity is being able to receive from the people around you. Like, let me just tell you this. You, you, can't, you can't just be a generous person if you're not surrounding yourself with generous people long-term. You wanna be more generous? Surround yourself with generous people. If you wanna be more life-giving, surround yourself with life-giving people. If you wanna be more kind, surround yourself with kind people. If you want to be more fruitful in life, surround yourself. Are you getting the theme? Whatever you want more of, surround yourself with those kind of people. If you want to be happy, surround yourself with happy people, people who have got it, people who aren't looking for the carnal, worldly things for their satisfaction. You show me your friends, I'll show you your future. There they are. If the people around you, the people that you're choosing to spend most of your time with, if you don't want your life to turn out like them, I would encourage you. I know that's a hard one because I'm meddling big time in your personal relationships, but you're probably not here in church because you're just trying to kill time. You probably showed up to a Sunday service because you're hoping to have God speak to you. You're hoping to get some principles that might change your life and, and help you, and I'm trying to help you. You have got to focus on the people you're spending most time with and the person you're trying to become, look around. Who are you spending your time with? Are they hungry for God? You will end up being more hungry for God. Are they more content? You will end up being more content. Great principles, right? But in the midst of pain, it can be really hard to choose this stuff when you're feeling depressed, when you're feeling down, when you're feeling low. It's hard to remember. It's hard to bring yourself to do it. Happiness can seem so far out of reach that it's not even worth trying. We ask ourselves questions like, is God trying to teach me something? Is he punishing me? If I had made better choices, would all this pain and suffering been avoided? Why does it feel like good people suffer and bad people get away with everything? Why is this happening to me? Where was God when all this stuff happened in my life? Where was he? What happened? And when we face things like that, it could be really tough to just recite gratitude. I understand that. I do. I want to turn your attention to a promise that Jesus said himself. And it makes all the difference. John 16, I have told you these things so that in me you can have peace. In this world, you will have trouble. Great promise, right? but he's not done but take heart I have overcome the world in this world you'll have trouble I've overcome the world you can have satisfaction you can have happiness you can be blessed you just have to lean on Jesus the final thought is this my final little point for you is what you need to overcome unhappiness and depression is a person. 
not a feeling, not a thing, not a promotion, not money, not a new boyfriend, not a new girlfriend, not even a marriage, nothing. Not, what we need is Jesus. That's what we need. That's the one thing. He's the one person. It's the one thing that we chase after and hold on to that won't leave us hungry for more, thirsty for more. Happiness is a choice we make every day. And it's not mind over matter. It's a choice to follow Jesus. Happy are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Happy are those who are poor in spirit and realize their need for God. Is it making sense now? The people who are happy are the ones that realize their need for him. Happy are those who hunger and thirst for the things of God. Happy are those who are persecuted for what? For doing right and doing things the way God said to do them. Happy are those who are leaning into Jesus every time. Every time. This has nothing to do with money. Has nothing to do with status. Has nothing to do with whatever you're trying to accomplish in life. It's in him that our depression is conquered. It's in him that our unhappiness flees. It's in him where true happiness and fulfillment and contentment comes from. And sometimes we just hit bottom. We just hit rock bottom. And our heart doesn't feel like it can get any lower. And let me tell you something. I know what that feels like. I know what it feels like to be rock bottom. Jail cells and prison sentences and looking in at a judge and wanting to like just lose everything and not wanting to wake up in the morning. I know what it feels like to be rock bottom. And, and you, some of you might be feeling that same way. It, it doesn't have to be my story. It's your story, but you feel it. You feel rock bottom. You feel like my heart has no, you just feel like there's no hope. You feel like there's no way that you could be satisfied. You feel like it doesn't matter what I do, good sermon, whatever. I just, I, I'm so, I can't. You ever had that feeling? Like, I just, I just can't. I don't even have the words for it. I can't. I don't know what to do anymore. I just can't. There is only one person who can help with that. And it's not me. It's not your spouse. It's not a raise. It's not a bonus. There's only one person who can help with that. It's Jesus. It's when we're at our lowest. It's when we're most receptive for the one who lifts our head. I pray you find what I found when I was at my bottom. If you're feeling low, if you're feeling depressed, this is not a light issue. People lose their lives over this. I'm not making light of it at all. It's not about just being unhappy. It's about finding the cure for everything in life, and it's Jesus. I pray that you find what I found. Hope in Christ. Hope in a miserable time. Light in the darkest time. I never knew how bad I needed him until I needed him. So I hope you can feel how much that you might need him today. So I just want to make the offer. I just want to give you the opportunity to just lean into him. If you're feeling unhappy, if you're feeling depressed, if you're feeling like just unsatisfied, that is not something you have to live with. Our God can help, wants to help. Send his son to die so that you can experience fullness in life and life to the full. I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes with me if you would. Private moment, nobody looking around, just this is a moment between you and God. I'll just facilitate it, that's all. As we're in this sensitive moment and letting the Holy Spirit do his work in our heart, I know I said a lot of things this morning, but I believe God was speaking in his own way to you. And I'm asking that hearts would be open to receive, that our minds would be free of distraction. I pray that you would receive the hope and love that is found only in Jesus. So if that's you today and you want to put your faith and your hope and your contentment in Christ, or maybe you used to be that way and it's time to come back to that, no matter your context, if that's you today, would you just lift your hand up and I want to pray for you. Go ahead and just lift it up and I'll pray for you. 
Amen, 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 amen. Just too many. There's so many. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. I see you too. I see you. Let's pray this prayer together. Come on, everyone in the house. We're a family here right now. Let's have, let's have a family moment. Let's pray this prayer together. Say, Father God, I give you my heart. I give you my loneliness, my sorrow, my sadness. I ask that you would fill me with your joy and your salvation, your forgiveness, and your hope. Fill me with your spirit and make me new. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you guys.